Hi guys, in this video I will analyze a video called Mankind Came From Monkeys, Atheist versus Muhammad Hijab in Hyde Park Speaker's Corner, which is split up into three parts for some reason and does not mention any monkeys. I wanted it to be concise, but then uh, somehow I went into more detail than I had originally planned. Because what I've noticed is that Muslims in general seem to have some sort of an identity crisis and the built-in inferiority complex makes matters even worse. And some react with indifference and simply create their own version of what Islam is and some are happy to see others defend Islam so that they can continue following what they were taught. Now the teachings of Islam demand obedience and the uncritical acceptance of what they are taught. So most Muslims are happy to have others do the thinking and they simply follow. In a previous video, I showed how to tackle the contents of claims with a Muhammad talking about bullshit and trying to impress a non-Muslim. I've also shown with the example of a different Muhammad how some Muslim apologists are frightfully ignorant and will lie and deceive to look good in front of the uncritical audience. Now here, I want to focus more on the applied methodologies, the tactics, and also with the Muhammad, the hijab version. I mostly want to show other Muslim apologists how ridiculous, dishonest, and outright stupid their arguments and their approaches are, and show non-Muslims how to tackle these tactics. And I hope we can all get to the stage where we use our brains and get beyond the really stupid stuff we're dealing with today. So let's dive right in and immediately we hit the first snag with the Muslim apologist who goes by the name of Muhammad Hijab after only seconds into the video asks a non-Muslim the question, how are we here? How did the universe come into existence? He immediately puts his foot in it, doesn't he? Now, as far as I'm aware, there are three fundamental areas left where we as humanity have no definitive answer. The origin of the universe, biological or organic life forms, and consciousness. And we know we don't know. And that's why apologists are desperately trying to fill these three gaps with their respective gods. By any means. And this guy with the pink vest does exactly that, asking about the origin of our universe, which is idiotic for many reasons. Now, I want to point out seven of these, okay? Because one, nobody knows the answer. And pretending an old book has the answer is futile, <laughs> actually quite childish. And three, how can the opinion of a non-Muslim decide over the existence of his God? Uh, let me just elaborate a bit. He asks a non-Muslim a question which he thinks can only be answered by using his favorite God. So, in consequence, if the non-Muslim is unable to answer this, in his childlike mind somehow this validates the existence of his God. His reasoning is that the watching Muslims will see the non-Muslim being unable to answer his question, simply because he's honest. And the Muslim apologist, since he's not, can present his fairy tale and label it as explanation or best explanation, as though this made any sense. But the uncritical audience will see this as a victory for Islam. Number four, what if the non-Muslim does present an answer and can substantiate it? Would the Muslim apologist then concede and give up his belief? I'll give you three guesses. Number five, the apologist is asking a layman for their opinion, a personal opinion, on a topic not even the experts have answers to. Is that intellectually honest? Does it serve any purpose other than generating brownie points? And number six, the way the question is asked is actually nonsensical, asking how did the universe come into existence? What does come into existence mean? I demonstrated just how feeble this is in a video where I asked at what point in time exactly does a water puddle come into existence? <laughs> and then number seven, the entire question is purely emotional and without any tangible value.
Well, obviously, this is all geared towards his fairy tale, where this undefined, unfathomable, undetectable being brings the universe into existence, as it were, ex nihilo, from within itself, and then handcrafts each human being individually, because it's got this hankering for a bit of humanoid worship, when 70,000 fresh angels every morning simply don't do it anymore for you. Okay, so the first tactic we see being applied here is asking questions about cosmology or biology they themselves don't understand. This is to create the impression that the level of understanding is much higher, which is fake, just bullshitting. And people like Mohammed Ijab have no zero understanding of anything scientific. Then moving on to narrowing down the atheist to a single view, which he can then attack and dismantle, or at least confuse. How? Well, he asks what the truth standard is and what is considered to be evidence, evidences. <laughs> but this is nonsensical, as truth is what can be compared to and which aligns with reality, and evidence is something which confirms or falsifies a conclusion, so they're very different things. The non-Muslim, Max, I gather, judging by the accent from Northern America, clearly provides a whole range of reasons what his reasons are for rejecting theist claims. And Hijab takes one of them and plays it back, which sounds familiar to the non-Muslim, and he agrees. Yes, that's what I said, not realizing that this single statement will now be used against him in the form of his definition of evidence. Not what he said but what it was narrowed down as, namely a probabilistic type of evidence where he stated that the scientific method, empirical observation and experimentation, for example, were equally important. But these are discarded as they're useless for the Muslim apologist in the pink vest. The Muslim now comes back to his universe question, asking, after mentioning inception, <laughs> how it came into existence, which is... I mean, it's really nonsensical, as nothing comes into existence. You simply can't demand an answer which contains words like truth or evidence where there is no conclusive answer. And the non-Muslim knows this and provides a really impressive reply. My answer is that we're still working on finding the truth of that, okay. and that it's very difficult for us to find an absolute truth given the time scale that it occurred on. We have some theories that are looking increasingly likely, but we don't have an absolute answer. However, I don't believe the theists do either. Okay, thank you. Hijab is lost because the answer was perfect, and he can't argue with anything here. So he tries another tactic. He changes the topic completely and now jumps to the fine-tuned universe claim, something I've debunked several times, like here in the fine-tuning video on Dawa Response Team. Hijab now tries to impress the non-Muslim by offering to define fine-tuning, which of course is impossible, and he immediately puts his foot in it saying, What I mean by finely tuned is that the variables or the constants in terms of physics yeah. are set in such a way as to allow any life to exist. Now, in physics you can't have variable constants. It's either the one or the other. But he doesn't understand anything scientific, so that's the result. He then claims that these variables or constants are set, I don't know how they're set, to allow any form of life to exist, but somehow forgetting to define what this life is that he is invoking. Yes, I have exposed him as being dishonest and an unscrupulous liar, but here I think he's just an uneducated Muslim, one who reads about something but not the texts themselves. And that's where he gets his half-baked philosophy arguments and his scientific nonsense. So by saying life, I assume he's referring to this planet and what his favorite creator god managed to get going on this planet only. Now, Max, the non-Muslim, does a marvelous job of showing him where he's wrong. But Hijab runs straight into another tactic often used, the false dichotomy. Asking whether the universe is finely tuned for life to exist, yes or no. And that's stupid, as there's multiple possibilities, not just one or zero. Since we don't know what life is, of course, then it is possible that maybe one or two parameters need to be at some certain value, or 150 or 15,000. Nobody knows. So this is followed by the 
well, I think this is the absolute favorite by Muslim apologists, the flip, the shifting of the burden of proof. Now, a claim needs to have evidence in order for it to be accepted. And theists like this Muslim apologist don't have any evidence for any of their claims. So they try and shift the burden of proof onto the non-Muslim, as is happening here. And if you say no, you have to substantiate that. Hijab makes the claim that there are variables which are somehow set and that this is some sort of fine tuning. He does not provide any evidence for this claim because, well, there is none. So he says the non-Muslim, if he does not accept this vapid claim, needs to substantiate that, which is obviously false and dishonest because he claims this so-called fine-tuning exists and he therefore is required to show that it does. If he can't, we can safely reject his claim. Now, I will not go into the contents, the, the detail of his nonsensical claim and stupid assertions. And what happens next is actually quite neat and expertly executed for the benefit of watching Muslims. Hijab fires off a series of very short questions in, in, in tiny steps, which are obviously true, and asks the non-Muslim whether he agrees each time, creating the impression that the non-Muslim has to agree with the Muslim, which is only the case for this tiny sub-portion. But for watching Muslims, this will not matter as they only see the non-Muslim in agreement. So hijab is the hero, the lion of Islam. It's almost a consensus in, in science now, yeah? in terms of physics, that physicists, whether they be agnostic, atheistic or theistic, acknowledge the fine-tuning of the universe. Now Stephen Hawking says this in The Brief History of Time, even Richard Dawkins says this. Uh, many different people, obviously Martin Rees wrote the book Just Six Numbers, many different individuals, they, they make this claim. Oh, wow. Okay, let's unpack this a bit, shall we? Now, first off, name dropping is a very common tactic. Muslim apologists take a name, claim this person says X. Why should this be impressive? I mean, we can't immediately verify whether this is true. And um, if it should turn out that this person offered their opinion on this, we don't know in what context what was said based on what assumptions using what basis and what quality of data. I mean, people like Sabur mostly use this one single tactic with his ridiculous evolution story. And the Muslim apologist Muhammad Hijab, he claims in all seriousness that Professor Stephen Hawking, in a book published something like 30 years ago, invoked the fine-tuning argument for life. Really? Now, just to be clear, Professor Hawking does not say this. This is what it really says. Because in A Brief History of Time, Hawking on page 126 says, if the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in a hundred thousand million million, the universe would have recollapsed before it ever reached its present size. Now, yeah, this would indicate, indeed, that Professor Hawking accepts fine-tuning. But it's a quote mine, a single sentence taken from a series of questions as... Just a few pages later, he states the exact opposite. This could then explain why the rate of expansion is still so close to the critical rate without having to assume that the initial rate of expansion of the universe was very carefully chosen. So hijab is lying once again. What he's doing is the often used practice of blindly copying Christian apologists. In this case, Dr. William Lane Craig, who writes exactly this on his blog and uses it in his debates. And no, any change of any of these values we have measured does not invalidate life. Because, well, very simply put, they are descriptive and not prescriptive. We merely observe them. And then Professor Dawkins, a biologist, not a physicist, as is claimed by hijab, does not say this either. He only talks about the appearance of fine-tuning and explains why it is stupid and unrealistic. I was invoking the idea that because we are here, we are alive, we are thinking about it, then however improbable the origin of life was, however improbable the origin of intelligence was, it has to have happened at least once because here we are thinking about it. Um, Victor Stenger, who will be known to and greatly respected by many people here, um, denies that the, that the universe is fine-tuned at all. 
If the universe, if the constants of the universe are indeed fine-tuned, how do we explain it? How do we explain the appearance that the universe is tuned to bring us into existence? Well, theists say God did it. Uh, God tuned, God twiddled the knobs and tuned the physical constants to have exactly the right values. That, of course, is no explanation at all because it leaves unexplained the tuner. It's just pushing the, the problem back one step. So we can instantly discount explanation number one. And for good measure, here's Professor Sean Carroll weighing in on the topic. that, it is still a terrible argument. It is not at all convincing. I will give you five quick reasons why theism does not offer a solution to the purported fine-tuning problem. And Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining in some detail why claims of fine-tuning and intelligent design are absolute, utter bullshit. Uh, I want to do just a fast tirade on stupid design, and uh, this will be fast. Uh, look at all the things that just want to kill us, okay? Uh, most planet orbits are unstable. Uh, star formation is completely inefficient. Most places in the universe will kill life instantly. Instantly. The people that say, oh, the forces of nature are just right for life. Excuse me. <laughs> just look at the volume of the universe where you can't live. You will die instantly. That is not, that's, not, that's not what I call the Garden of Eden. No engineer would design that at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, but once again you can see that all these attempts at bringing in well-known names are just lies. But just to hammer this home, what if all these people did have an opinion that fine-tuning is the answer? So what? Why would their opinions make false claims true? The facts count. Reality and truth are what make the difference, not personal opinions. The non-Muslim is actually very good. He counters all the claims beautifully and exposes the flaws in the arguments of hijab. But I want to focus on the concepts here and not just the contents, which I have also refuted and debunked many times over. What is the probability that the universe could have randomly allowed for human life to, or any life to exist? The Muslim in his pink vest now jumps into another area he does not understand probability. But first we go back to the original era he does not understand. A universe. The universe. Our universe. And yes, again. Now, Max the non-Muslim eloquently answers the question. Hijab doesn't get it because even though this invocation of big numbers and probability is a bit of a grey area for him as it is for most Muslim apologists. And they still bring it up. A lot. And I think I'll come back to this a bit later. Now, while trying to explain why the probability is actually quite high, they get sidetracked into yet another area in this discussion where hijab is totally clueless, but makes claims with conviction. The, the majority of scientists clearly believe in the Big Bang and clearly believe in the expanding universe model. Yeah, yeah this is complete nonsense. No, this, this is not about what he calls evidences, nor does anyone believe in science. <laughs> He mixes up everything in his willful ignorance. But a lot of Muslim apologists will do this. They bring up cosmology even when talking to cosmologists and think they know something even the experts can't explain. The Dunning-Kruger effect, where people think they know something based on half-knowledge acquired when reading about something, especially when condensed by, I don't know, Christian or whatever, other apologists. Now, for example, Tzortzis displayed this quite openly when it came to embryology. And we see it in action here once again, with cosmology being used again and again, painfully displaying the incompetence of this apologist. He then tries his tactic of misrepresenting the non-Muslim and getting a statement as a basis which was never made. Now, a lot of non-Muslims either don't catch this or let slide until they realize it comes back to bite them. In this case, Max catches it and protests, exposing hijab and his dishonest tactics. And who has no choice but to retract? Does he apologize? Mm, nope. Which you're saying you don't. Yeah. Which you're saying you don't. But well, no, I'm not saying I don't or I do. I'm saying I don't know. Okay, fine. That's fair enough. That's, that's a fair enough. Opinion. Now, Max never mentions any inception or creation of universe. Only creationists do. Also, he never states that the universe is definitely infinite. And this time hijab gets away with his dishonest tactic. 
that the universe existed for an infinitely uh, long amount of time. Now I'm saying, what's the proof for that? Since you're the one who's asking for proof, generally, I'm also in my right to ask you for your proof. Not only that, he also flips the burden of proof again, doing the Shabir shuffle and making it look as though the non-Muslim made a claim, which he never did. He clearly said we have no evidence one way or the other. And that is why it becomes obvious the non-Muslim Max thought he was being asked something different, answering a somewhat a, a different question. He obviously did not expect so much dishonesty. Now, Muhammad Hijab asked for proof again and again when he was told there is no such thing as proof, just evidence for or against something. And hijab, as do most other apologists, expects certainty and absolutes, something we don't have in the real world. What hijab says here and in this situation and context is a lie. But it could be that in a different situation, the very same statement might be true. No scientist in their right mind would claim to have absolute knowledge of the beginnings of the universe. All we have are theoretical models. Okay. Well said and correct without a flaw. But hijab can't grasp that. He is not mentally equipped to handle such clear and robust statements refuting his idiotic tactics. And it becomes clear when he now tries to repeat what he has heard, totally screwing it up, making it the opposite of what was just so clearly stated. And then in his desperation, now adds another tactic in here. Again, one he does not understand at all. Is that you don't have any evidence or proof to suggest that the universe was here for an infinite amount of time. That's what you said. I certainly don't have proof. Okay, you don't have proof. He adds in infinity and again evidences and proof. He sees he can't get anywhere so he resorts to his emergency measures. You are deviating. You seem to be deviating away from the principle that you've laid down for yourself. Where he entrapped Max into making a single statement, which he never really did, well, but now it's coming back to bite him, which he realizes. I mean, this is one smart cookie. Hijab also needs to lie and claim Max said something he did not say. So this is now turning into one big mess. So why would you assume that the universe here existed forever? You said no, it you may did. have. It may have. Okay. There's, a very, there's a very great gap, and we should be precise about this. There's a very great gap between saying that something is likely or unlikely and saying it's possible, and also another gap over to saying that it's true. Okay. I did not say it was true. No, I did I not say it was particularly likely That's or right. unlikely. I said it was possible. No, I like that. It's oh, possible yeah. to find spaghetti monsters up there somewhere. So let's just be clear. I'm not saying that so, it's 100% no, no. no true no, or untrue. Max explains what was said and what was not, and Hijab simply steps back without as much as apologizing for his constant lies and misrepresentations. And here comes the next tactic. Bring in something he really does not understand, something he was schooled on and received really good advice, something he therefore knows is wrong and still repeats it. Infinity. Yet watching Muslims adore him anyway. He uses a thought experiment he doesn't really comprehend and defines infinity as Look, people don't understand what infinity is. Infinity literally is. Everything becomes possible, literally. Infinity doesn't exist in the real world. And then says infinity does not exist. Infinity this, infinity that. Mathematicians and Hilbert and all that jazz. Why does this guy do that? I mean, what, what is he trying to prove when, I mean, just a few weeks ago, this is what Hilbert he was showing. made the claim yeah. that this, because the universe is not flat, yeah. right, therefore yeah. um, the universe is not infinite exactly. and therefore infinity does not exist exactly, in yeah. the universe. Yeah. However, okay. however, yeah. he was wrong, Why okay? is he wrong? Why is he wrong? because at that, that point in time, in 1915, they couldn't measure the global topology of the universe. In the 21st century, it was finally possible to make these measurements, okay? And the measurements came back that the geometry was Euclidean, and so therefore Hilbert was wrong. And therefore his statement that infinity does not exist in reality, which is, by the way, not a statement for mathematics, no, but right? It's, it's, it's been disproved. If I say that the evidence points to a conclusion, yeah. and then we show that that evidence did not point to that conclusion. I don't have to prove that the opposite is true. But he simply ignores it and now continues to spread his lies. Why would anyone do that? His tactic is to make his opponents look bad and make him look the winner. I mean, this is hollow. 
I mean, Phil gave him such a good summary. So you want to keep saying stuff like that, and you can do a good, entertaining show for the crowd, no, but, but you're not sorry. actually progressing the debate, are you? I think you should You put can put on your clown no, show no, if you no, want, no, no, right? No, no, but no, I don't no. think anyone's going to be impressed with the level of your intellectual rigor. Has he learnt anything? No. His constant harping on philosophy on backfires as soon as someone knows something and has some background in philosophy. Level. It also shows the danger of these discussions level. drifting off into who said what and where, why and when, in which philosophical environment and completely losing track of what was the point. And then he makes this statement. It's not that it just doesn't exist. It's something which conceptually, mathematically, philosophically cannot exist. For the examples I've just given you, but it's not my example, it's the mathematician's example. It's Hilbert's example. It's called Hilbert's sure. I think, I don't know, do I need to point out how dishonest all this is? So the next part is now yet another demonstration of his inability to understand the concept of infinity and we jump to the next 18 minute segment in video two. And we are back to his inability to understand cosmology or probability and more unsubstantiated claims about fine tuning and his creator God and more illogical and really stupid conclusions. Like if something is improbable in the opinion of one non-Muslim, this shows the existence of his favorite creator God. Oh boy, how is that supposed to work? So immediately there's a disconnect here, okay? He says there is no infinity because it contradicts the, what he calls, the expanding universe model. That's not a model, it's an observation leading to several models as explanations of the observations. Ah, hijab, as do so many Muslim apologists, throws around catchwords trying to sound all sciency, like with redshift, singularity, big bang theory. But it's obvious he doesn't know what he's talking about. He totally butchers the Big Bang, mistaking it for today's expansion theory. <laughs> so this tactic fails miserably. Going from infinity he does not understand into probability he does not understand. Let me just pause here briefly. If you roll a dice, or a die it should be, you have a one in six chance or probability of rolling, let's say, a six. But, and this is what most Muslim apologists can't comprehend and get their head around, it can happen you get a six on the first roll, or after 20. You do not have to roll six times exactly. So after this, we get another false dichotomy, an extremely common fallacy. No, just because one is improbable does not make anything else, number one, the only alternative, and number two, more probable. I've explained this in my Gumball video. So, of course, the, the non-Muslim spots this and actually laughs about this silly way of argumentation. And then we get into more name dropping and claiming that a person is a weak philosopher because they are not a philosopher but a biologist. He's childish and useless. And we've just heard what Professor Dawkins has to say about this. So the non-Muslim asks a question, how can the Muslim know what he claims to know? And we get to see the next tactic. Squirm, deflect, blabber and lie. And then going back to flipping. Because according to the Muslim, the non-Muslim needs to explain why an intelligent creator or force is improbable. But... As soon as he's asked a real-world question, he has to fold. It's now a matter of rinse, spin, repeat. We are back. Who created the laws and the universe? And our pink shirt does what he does so well, and that is throw in the word philosophy a lot, without cause or reason. And with that, we jump to a very short part three, where we see hijab, all he does is like bad-mouthing atheists with examples the Muslim does not even understand. And just to add some more false claims. Now, the, the non-Muslim is very smart and an on-the-ball non-Muslim and calls Mohijab out and exposes how he acts and performs as a showman. He summarizes what had happened and how hijab had trapped him by starting, do you agree? And then taking that answer as the only possible one. Another tactic employed, narrowing down and then pretending that is the only position or argument. Now that he is exposed and his game will be over, he now retreats and makes it look as though he's letting the not-Muslim off the hook. A, what I would call, not exactly honest intellectual tactic. 
but what am I expecting? Now, to round things off, he closes with some lies and a fat lie. <laughs> no, he did not demonstrate anything. And he did not come up with a 99.9997% himself either. All he did was make unsubstantiated claims, and that's all he did. And Max, the non-Muslim, was not playing the devil's advocate here, nor did he contradict himself, which shows how little our little pink-shirt Muslim understands, philosophically. <coughs> but I'm sure many Muslims will not understand his blunders and dishonesty, and they will continue to celebrate him as an intellectual giant, the lion of Muslim apologetics. <coughs> Okay, thanks for holding out until the end, taking interest in the video. If you like it, give me a thumbs up, and if you don't, give me a thumbs down. But do me a favor, tell me why you liked it, or why you, and what you did not like. Thanks.